keynote for this morning, Mark Deluzio. And Mark and I have known each other for uh, many years now, um, going all the way back to the Lean Summits in the mid-1990s, um, which uh, Jim Womack, when he was at MIT, um, put together after publishing the books, uh, The Machine That Changed the World and Lean Thinking. Um, Mark is certainly one of the pioneers in lean accounting and even in lean. And uh, he was with an organization where really a lot of it first came in um, to start and hit the ground back in the late 1980s. Um, and Mark, like I was doing at that time, was working to understand and figure out this new business model. When, again, when virtually no resources were available to, uh, to learn from, um, like I just talked about. Um, other than getting your hands dirty through experimentation on the shop floor. Again, shop floor being the office, shop floor being um, in the plant, shop floor being in a warehouse, wherever your particular shop floor might be. Uh, Mark was also the principal architect of the Danaher business system, but uh, since those days he's uh, advised many organizations on their own lean journeys. Um, he's authored the book Turn Waste into Wealth and will soon publish his newest book, Flatline. Um, he's also served as a, a member of boards and also a member of the Shingo Academy. Um, Mark's also the founder of Lean Horizons, which is a um, services organization on five different continents. Mark is also one of the Fab Five. So the Fab Five are, he's one of the original lean accountants that actually helped me in my early lean accounting research and journey as well, and also the uh, five of the original lean accountants that presented at the original lean accounting summit in 2005. So with that, please welcome Mark Deluzio to open the 2019 Lean Leadership Week. I have a confession to make. You know, everybody talks about Tashiono and the cow and the water, all the guys that we all learn from. But <clears throat> the first time I met some of the pioneers here, Ori Fumi, Gene Cunningham, Joe Murley, Jerry Solomon, right? We all met on our first Kaizen together, and it was uh, facilitated by Abraham Lincoln, okay? <laughs> so just to let you know where we are, because Gene and I were talking about that last night. It's like, oh my God, you know? I mean, 9-11 was 18 years ago. My goodness, you know? It seems like yesterday. So, uh, anyway, okay, we're not that old, but maybe it was Henry Ford, I don't know, Ori, was it Ford? Okay, okay. So, uh, so anyway, uh, how many people here are going through some semblance of a lean transformation? Everybody. I respect everybody to raise their hand, right? That's why you're here. How many people think it's going really well? Nobody, nobody raised their hand. Wow. It's hard work. Well, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I put this thing together because last year, you know, Ori and I were talking, I was talking to Jim Hunsinger, and I said, you know, it's really great to come up here and talk about all the great things that Danaher has done with the essence of the Danaher business system and Watermold and Lantec and all these great companies that have done, Marquip, Jerry, right? and all these great companies, right? Ensign Bickford, Joe Murley, where are you, Joe? Okay, um, you know, all these great companies, Shingo Prize Award winners, all these great accolades and all that. But, you know, I said, you know, we made a lot of mistakes, and Jim and I were talking last night, and we said, you know, when we were doing it in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, 1990s, okay, uh, we, <laughs> we, uh, we didn't have any books to go to. There were no consultants. I mean, we, yeah, we used Shinga Jitsu at the time. Okay, they were really our only consultants, right? And uh, we had to figure it out by ourselves. So, you know, Jim asked me last night, he said, you know, when you developed the first lean accounting system in 1989, how'd you do it, right? And I said, well, all I did was I understood the principles of the Toyota production system. And then I looked at you know, I'm a CMA, I'm a trained accountant, <clears throat> and don't hold that against me. But, uh, uh, but I, I looked at the principles of what they taught you in school, and I said, those things are anti-lean. They're, they're forcing the wrong behavior. You know, things like absorption accounting and purchase price variance and all those things, variance analysis and even standard cost, right? 
So let's just stop doing it, okay? You know, I, I have a joke I tell my clients all the time when they complain to me about things that are going on in the company. I say, you know, did you hear about the guy that went to the doctor? And he said, hey, doc, he said, every time I go like this, it hurts. And the doctor said, don't do that, okay? I mean, <laughs> don't do, stop doing it, okay? So that's what we did, okay? And the one thing that people didn't understand was your management accounting system does not have to be GAP, okay? You can do it on the back of a napkin, all right? And a lot of people don't understand that. So, so anyway, <clears throat> I said, Jim, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put together some of the screw-ups that I did over the years. Uh, my wife looked at this and she said, Mark, you're missing about 100 errors that you've made, right? I go, no, Diane, this is about business, not, my, not our personal life, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so uh, we've been married 39 years, so we're doing okay. Uh, but even that, right, they look at our marriage, they look at our DBS, they look at wire mold, they look at all these great things that people have done, and they, all they see is the top of the iceberg. But you gotta remember, it's the bottom of the iceberg that sunk the Titanic, right? And so, uh, so this is what they see, and the path to success, whether it's your personal life, your professional life, your company, whatever, is wrought with a lot of setbacks. Okay, and it's really all about how do you drive the setbacks? How do you, how do you recover from them? Wire mold was not a straight line. They screwed up just like we did at Danaher, okay? But they learned from it, okay? And they created a fostered an environment, a blameless environment where it's okay to make mistakes, okay? And so <clears throat> you look at that and you say, okay, well, let's talk about the bottom part of this slide instead of the top part. The top part is all the glory, all the results, all the accolades, right? Let's talk about how we all screwed up and what we did to fix it, okay? So that's what I see here, you know, and uh, I remember somebody at Toyota in Japan in the early days told me all companies, even Toyota, have problems. How you respond to those problems is what, is what different, differentiates the company from being world class or not so world class. Can you put together root cause, you know, A3 thinking type solutions to bury that problem forever and then move on? Or are you going to respond to it with quick temporary countermeasures and then two months later that problem shows up again? Okay, so that was the thinking that they had. All companies are going to have problems. So, you know, the whole essence of the Dan or her business system was not to go in and do things for them, for our companies, but to create a learning organization where we actually taught people how to fish. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So uh, that was a real key. So I'm going to talk about these mistakes, okay? Uh, and hopefully you will walk away, you know, what, what I tell my clients, they say, well, why should we hire you guys? And I say, well, you know, because we've made more mistakes than you have, <laughs> okay? And I'm not going to let you make the same mistakes that we made, so your speed to value is going to be better than Dana Hurts or Warren Moles or anybody else's, right? So uh, <clears throat> that's why you should hire us, because we screwed up more than you did, <laughs> okay? And, uh, and so, uh, so that's really something I want to, uh, there's, there's probably 50 things I could stand up here and tell you about, but I just picked 10, some of the top 10s. As I was putting this together the other day, I was saying, no, I probably missed that one too, and I missed that one, but these are the 10 we're gonna at least talk about today. So, number one is, I wrote a, I wrote a paper on, uh, and I can give it to Jim, and he can put it on a website or whatever, it's called, the, the, I call it the Lean Trilogy, right? Now, I do realize that there are stakeholders other than these three. Their society, the environment, suppliers are stakeholders, right? All those, right? But most companies focus on uh, shareholders, okay? And to me, shareholders is a result of doing the right things with your employees and with your customers, okay? What you need to do is basically get an equilibrium between all three of these so it's a non-zero-sum game where everybody wins, okay? And by the way, there's nothing wrong with making money. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a good thing for everybody, not only shareholders. It's a good thing for employees. It's a good thing for customers. It's a good thing for suppliers. I'm not ashamed about making money. I think that, I mean, if you, if you go through, quite frankly, and do lean, and you're not profitable, I think that's a, a hallmark of failure, 
I really do think making money is a good thing, but it's not the only thing, okay? So, so <clears throat> we shouldn't be ashamed about it. A lot of companies are. Uh, but we should also look at our customers and our employees, okay? So all stakeholders must win, and we gotta think about that. Now there'll be a decision from time to time that you make that's gonna compromise one stakeholder over another. Like for example, I can go in and I can say, uh, hey, let's satisfy our customers. I'm gonna cut 50% of the price for our customers. They'll be delighted. The employees want when we start closing plants, the shareholders won't be happy, of course, right? And then ultimately the customers won't be happy because we won't have any more ability to, to supply them, right? So, so you have to do it all in context of all three groups in terms of making sure everything is a one-win. Okay, that, that was one of the lessons that we learned because we were very, in the early days at Danaher, shareholder focused. Okay, so we had to change that. It's not a sustainable model if you only focus on shareholders, okay? Uh, there's a lot of companies out there trying to do lean. I was just with the CEO of an $8 billion diversified company who had just been doing lean for two years. And I said, well, what does your lean organization look like? He pointed to his top lean guy, his DBS guy, if you will, and he said, that's it. He wasn't set up to win. They didn't have, they didn't have a, a, a structure within the organization to be able to do this, okay? So <clears throat> it wasn't gonna happen, I explained that to him. $8 billion, by the way, global, worldwide company. And uh, so I said, uh, but what we did, we recognized that early and we put DBS people in positions within plants and all that, and what we found was that the most expendable person was put into that role. And what we learned was we had to really cultivate a, 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 a position where the people we put in that, those roles were gonna be our future leaders, okay? Hard to do. And no, no, no disrespect to anybody that went into those roles, but, but you know, when they went in, it might have been the maintenance manager who barely made it out of high school, who couldn't facilitate, uh, maybe knew tooling really well, but he's the wrong guy to put in that role, okay? So, you know, we had to put future leaders and we had to cultivate to that, to that degree, okay? So put future leaders into these key positions within your organization and cultivate that and actually use your lean office as a vehicle for not only building your culture but developing future leaders as well because you want to run the business with lean principles, right? And that's, that's kind of what you want to, want to think about here. <clears throat> this is a big one. I uh, saw an article the other day on LinkedIn that said, the guy, the guy recommended that, how do you start lean? How do you do it? Well, just start working on stuff that bugs you. What? Okay, great. So I've got long lead times, poor quality, right? Poor delivery. But you know what really bugs me? The mail room. I'm going to go fly best in the mail room. Okay? You get my point? That's not, that's not how you succeed with lean. And the other thing that we learned is that through the, you know, we, when I brought in the strategy deployment process in the early 90s for Danaher, and I'm very happy to say Danaher is still using it today. That is probably one of the most bastardized tools in the market today. I don't know what it is about that tool, but everybody wants to screw with it, okay, without learning first the principles of what it's all about. And there are so many flavors of it out there today. today. There's so many books on it out there today. We developed and cultivated, it took us about four or five years to get it right, but we cultivated this process uh, at Danaher and it became a very key play in our, in our Danaher business system, okay? And it really told us not only what we had to strictly focus on, but it forced us to make conscious decisions as to what we were not gonna do. And that's important, because you can't do everything. Okay, so not tying to strategy is really, is really a problem and uh, there's a tendency when you do lean to do the easy stuff, paint yellow lines on the floor, put up posters and things like that, okay? I'm not against that stuff, but I go back to what Jim said. Where's your basic standard work combination sheet? Where's your fundamental flow? Where's your, you know, are you, are you, are you aligning to the principles? That stuff is hard to do, believe it or not. It's not easy, okay? And, uh, 
And so <clears throat> the fundamental basics are being missed today because we're doing all the easy stuff, okay? So we had to kind of get over that too in the early days because everybody wanted to have a nice little plant when the CEO came in and, and walks through. And, but, you know, if you really know what to look for, you can really get under the covers and find out, are you really doing lean here or not, you know? And, uh, yeah, I, I love your, I love your uh, MDI board and I love your, your yellow lines and all that good stuff, but are you really doing it, right? And, and so that's the stuff that you really have to look for, right? So, you know, what we said, I, I kind of came up with this myself, and it might be different for your business, but I like to, I like to kind of look at 70% of my lean activities that are tied back to my strategic initiatives coming out of strategy deployment, okay? Those are the things I should really be working on. Things that are relegated to, and by the way, your basics today might be breakthrough for you. Let's say you can't, you have poor quality, okay? And uh, wire mode does not. They've got a pretty good quality. Not to say they're not going to continue to improve it, but that gets relegated at wire mode to a KPI to daily management, okay? However, you still have significant quality problems. That's a breakthrough for you. So something that's as mundane and daily management for one company may not be for somebody else. And we had, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, about safety, quality, delivery, and cost, and how we think about that in terms of, in terms of that context. So, so that's, that's kind of what we, we look at here, uh, is to tie our initiatives back to our strategic imperatives, okay? Oh yeah, by the way, that means you need to have a strategic planning process, <laughs> okay? And a st strategy deployment process. Those are two different things, right? So. Uh, this is probably, in the book I'm writing, as Jim said, is called uh, Flatlined, and the subtitle is uh, uh, Why Lean Transformations Fail and What to Do About It, okay? And I've seen so many companies in my career in so many transformations, and, and, and uh, after a while, you kind of start seeing the same pattern, right? You kind of start seeing similar things, and that's what I'm writing about in this book. But one of the things I've noticed is, and this is hard to do, and the companies that did it well, like the water molds of the world, like the Danners of the world, okay, have learned how to graduate from point Kaizen, where you go into a single function, a cell, accounts payable process, HR process, whatever, value stream map that, process map if you need it, uh, put in standardization, standard work, and all that, and really make that function efficient. But ultimately, you got to take a step back and say, how do we Kaizen the enterprise? And in order for that to happen, all players in all functions have to be on the same page and, and leading with principles, okay? And that's hard to do, especially when you get anybody here from sales and marketing, <laughs> especially those guys, okay? Uh, so, uh, so, you know, Gravitating from point Kaizen to enterprise Kaizen is a real key if you're really going to become a true lean organization over the time, over the course of time. That's, that's really key, okay? So, you know, uh, <clears throat> most companies, first of all, view lean as a manufacturing thing, okay? And that's why I changed the name from the Danaher Production System to the Danaher Business System because it is not about production. It's about the business, okay? And uh, I look at, uh, it had the basis of the Toyota production system principles and tools, but it grew bigger than the Toyota production system. So I, I made a comment the other day on LinkedIn, is that I think, I think Toyota, in my opinion, because I've been there and I've seen all the factories in, in Japan, I think they're probably the best manufacturing company in the world today. And you might argue with me, okay? But they're up there, okay? Danaher is nowhere near the manufacturer that Toyota is. They probably never will be. But Danaher is a better business than Toyota, okay? And, and so that's what we got to think about here. How do you craft your business system, not your production system? But, and by the way, production system would be a part of that, okay? How do you craft your business system for your business and make it yours? You can't just copy Danaher. You can't just copy Toyota, okay? It works for Danaher. It's not going to work for anybody else, all right? You got to do it yourself. But you can take best practices from these businesses. That's what we did, okay? So that's what you gotta think about here, okay? By the way, Danaher's gross margin in, 19, in, in 2018 was uh, 55% and Toyota's was, seven, Toyota's was 17, 
Okay, not to say that the financial results are the only metric that you gotta look at, but when I talk about a business, and if you wanna talk about shareholder return, you know, we looked at it from a complete eclectic business system, not just a production system, and that's really key. And some, are, some might argue that TPS is, in fact, a business system, but I haven't seen it as much as I really would have liked to see it. But anyway, we'll talk about that later. Uh, so we refuse to operate our functions differently, but we expect everybody else to be lean. Sales and marketing, going out and discounting the heck out of product to pull product into a quarter. I have a client that got 30% of the orders on the last two days of the month. Okay, and they're trying to do hygienical level scheduling and level loading and all that stuff, right? And sales was not on the same page. So not only did they discount the heck out of the product, manufacturing had to spend all kinds of extra costs and overtime and everything else to get the product out. So they lost margin on the top line and on the bottom line, okay? Oh, by the way, the sales guys got their bonuses and their cruises and their vacations. They won. The enterprise lost. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so, so we got to all be on the same page as a enterprise, and that's what really we got to look at. Uh, how many people here have heard of Mira and Miri? Everybody's heard of Muda, right? Mira and Miri, right? These things are fundamentally set, in my opinion and in my experience, by policy. Management policy is driving Mira and Muri, okay? If you look at where unevenness comes from, and if you look at where you know, unreasonableness comes from, it's usually set by policy with all the great intentions of the world, but they're dysfunctional when it comes to a lean mindset, okay? So, so you really gotta think through how this works, and uh, you know, a sales guy going back and challenging the customer, do, Mr. Customer, do you really need 50,000 of those on June 1st? Or can we ship you 10,000 per month for the next five months, okay? And we can take those 10,000 and split them out 2,500 2, a week, okay? That's unevenness if he just takes that order and expects manufacturing to ship all 50,000 on June 1st, okay? That's hard to do, okay? And so what does that mean? We've gotta kinda of go back and re-engineer the sales compensation system to in, in, incite because he's not going to want to lose that sale, all right? And if you tell him, hey, you're not going to get paid now for five months because we're not going to ship that stuff until, you know, December, you're not going to do it. So you've got to go back and re-engineer how people get paid, compensation, things like that. That's just an example, okay? But our policies alone cause all this waste, and that's really what happens, right? So <clears throat> I asked senior leaders to actually consider all their policies and uh, match them up to some of the principles that we talk about, okay? And it's unbelievable what comes out when you do that. So think about that, right? Because what you wanna do is you wanna run your business in the context of the principles. And then the tools kinda come along with it, right? That's really important too, but the principles are really key. I don't know. Ori, do you know how to financially justify a 5S? Jerry, Gene, I don't know, people have asked me to do it before. Joe, how about you? I mean, financially justified, justify a 5S event. It's kind of like going to the gym and saying, okay, I worked out a half an hour on the treadmill and I want to see data now that proves that that was a good thing for me to do, okay? It doesn't happen, okay? Some things you just kind of got to go with your gut and say, hey, intuitively, these are the right things to do, okay? And, and uh, 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 when you get a CFO coming down asking for an ROI justification on everything you do, you might as well just get your resume ready and look for another job. Because it's not going to work. Okay? I'm not saying you don't have to show results over time, but if you're going to cost justify every single thing you do, you're going to lose. Can't do it. And we did have that problem at Danaher in the early days. We had CFOs going around asking, where's the beef? You know, it doesn't work. So, uh, of course, you know, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on traditional accounting practice. I think that's what this whole session is about a lot. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. I'd be happy to talk to you about that. I'm sure all the other guys would too. Uh, but, you know, 
looking at these traditional accounting practices that really drove dysfunctional behaviors is a killer if you don't address it. Is a killer if you don't address it. So that's a real key, okay? It's interesting because I, I remember I was with a CFO and a CEO of a business walking through one of their plants. Where were we? We were down in uh, Arkansas. And I said to the CFO, how do you pay all these guys out here? And he said, uh, <clears throat> all on machine uptime, mach machine utilization, right? And I said, okay, uh, well, why do you do that? We paid a lot of money for that equipment, and we want to make sure we get use out of it. Oh, okay. So let me ask you a question. That shiny new car you got sitting on the parking lot, you paid a lot of money for that too, right? He goes, yeah. Are you going to ride it around the block tonight 100 times to get utilization out of it? He said, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, why not? Well, because, and he gave me all the reasons, right? And I said, look, why do you choose to run your business different than the way you run your life? We, we pretty much run a pretty lean life if you look at ourselves, okay? I mean, you may not know that here, but, uh, <laughs> but, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I mean the whole idea... We don't go out and buy six months of milk because it's on sale. But the purchasing guy does. All right? You see what I'm saying? Why do we do this stuff? Okay? So we don't run our lives the same way we run businesses. And a lot of that has to do with the metrics that we think are important. Okay? So, so think about that. The guy that tells me, why do we need to do more changeovers? We reduced the changeover time on a, in one week on a machine, a thermoforming machine, by uh, 75%, okay? And I proved that they can now make all 12 parts every 1.2 days. You mean to tell me every 1.2 days we've got to do 12 changeovers? I go, yeah. I mean, well, why? They couldn't understand it. I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, how many of you guys here have ever had a barbecue in your backyard? And they said, uh, yeah, they all raised their hand. All right, let's just say you're serving hot dogs and hamburgers. Now, you're cooking. Do you just put the hamburgers on first, then make all the hamburgers, serve them to your guests, and then make all the hot dogs? Oh, no, we don't do that. Well, why not? Well, because some of our guests want hot dogs and some of them want hamburgers. And Uncle Joe wants both, by the way. So, okay. So, we don't do it. I said, well, why do you do that in manufacturing? Do your orders come in for, the, for, for that machine, the 12 parts? Do all part number one come in in the first week? Because you're choosing to change over on Saturday, make all the parts during the week for part one, change over on Saturday, they're avoiding changeovers, then make all part number two the next week, and so forth. I said, what? Your orders don't come in that way. They come in with one and five and eight and six and 12. They're, I said, why do you guys insist on making just hamburgers in the first week and not hot dogs? Then they got it, okay? So as you guys kind of try to coach others in your organization, Use real-life examples, okay? It's really helpful to do that because sometimes people don't make the, the connection, okay? But use real-life examples. It really is true. Look at your own life and how you live your own life in terms of the lean things that you do, okay? So, you know, I'm a big fan of tools. I'm a big fan of getting really good at the tools, and I prided myself in the early days of becoming really good at stuff like Jim talked about, standard work, and and, and SMED, and uh, I'm not a real good TPM guy, but I, I, other people do that, but uh, there's some things you just can't do all really well, and there's better people at it. But here's how I look at tools. If uh, I, I know how to make, I know how to, how to use every single tool that went into building my house but I don't know how to build a house. You see the difference? Lean is about building the house, okay? So just because you become really good, and, and what ends up happening is we become enamored with the tools. GE did that with Six Sigma. You saw where that led them. I was just talking to Larry Culp about that the other day. And, and so, you know, don't build your business system around a tool. Use the tools appropriately. Become very good at the tools, okay, because you need to but use those tools to execute building your house. And that's really the difference. And we had to learn that. And by the way, strategy deployment really helped us with that because strategy deployment to me was the architecture 
of the house in terms of what we wanted that, that business to be, okay, and all that. So, so uh, be really key. We became enamored in the early day with, we were measuring the number of Kaizians and how many people got trained. Who cares? Why does your customer care how many Kaizians you've done? Okay? They care about good quality, good value, good delivery, good lead times, all that stuff, right? And, and so they don't care that you've done 50,000 Kaizen this year. So think about your metrics from the customer's perspective, okay? And, and don't become enamored with, uh, with tools, okay? Become enamored, as I say here, with delighting your employees, your customers, and your shareholders, okay? That's what you should be enamored with and then use Lean and all the tools and all that stuff to be able to drive that, right? And that's, that's the real key. Um, leadership viewing this as a spectator sport. I probably don't need to say much about that here because uh, you know, our initiative initially was to go in and do projects from the DBS office and go do things for them, okay? And nobody was learning, which is a problem, all right? We had to be able to transfer knowledge and know-how, not only explicit knowledge that you'll get from a book, but the tacit knowledge of the know-how in terms of how to do it and apply it to different situations. Okay, that's really key. And so, you know, the old adage from the Bible, give a fish to a man and you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. That was the fundamental philosophy of the DBS office that we wanted to be able to teach know-how and build the culture in accordance with the fundamental principles of what we all aspire to, right? So that's, that's, that was a real key for us and kind of a breakthrough. It sounds kind of simple now, right? But we didn't do this. We were going in executing projects, putting points on the board. That's great, but that's not what it's all about. All right, don't worry, putting points on the board is a big part of that, but teaching and creating a learning organization is real key, all right? So that's, something to think about as you go through, right? Um, safety quali quality delivery cards, this is an interesting one because uh, this was our hierarchy that we developed over the years, okay? And SQDC in that order, safety always being number one, okay? Regardless, I'm gonna shut the plant down if I have a very unsafe environment. Quality, okay, so I am not gonna ship to me, the delivery commitment, I am not going to ship bad quality because quality is higher on the totem pole. I am not going to not ear ship for a late delivery because cost is low. Okay? I am not going to put in a temporary countermeasure to 100% inspect, inspect my product because cost does not, does not uh, <coughs> trump quality. Okay? And by the way, inspection... We can have a whole discussion on inspection as to whether or not inspection is value added uh, and all that, but that's a subject for another day, okay? But anyway, I am, I'm, you know, cost usually is what everybody goes by, okay? And I, I could tell you, and I'm, I've, I've been close to GE over the years and some of the other companies that have thought the mantra was cost, 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 not safety, quality, delivery cost. I have a client right now who has a... Uh, they're, they're looking at, they, they, they've identified five major hazards in their plant, safety hazards, okay? And I was just on the uh, phone with the CEO the other day, and I said, Good. I said, why, why are you guys planning to, attract, uh, to address these hazards, you know, one in March, one in July, one in September, one in December, whatever, right? If you know about them, how can you let this happen, okay? And they're wondering, by the way, why their employee engagement scores are going down, okay? So, um, and so I said, how could you let known hazards, now forget the legal liability, if I'm a prosecutor, and the guy loses his hand, and it's something you knew about six months earlier, and didn't do anything about it, consciously didn't do about it, it's in your plan, you said you're gonna address that in October, okay? Then, God help you, okay? But morally, if you really do live by this, which they swore they did, when I ask the question, why are we delaying all this? Because we don't have the resources. So my next response was, well, you're picking cost over safety, okay? That's what you're doing. They all got upset with me. You know, I'm old enough now to be very frank and direct. I don't have time to screw around. I only have so much time on this life. 
and you know, and I, I can't, I, sometimes you just can't let people guess the right answer, especially when somebody's gonna get hurt, okay? So, uh, so I said, you're, you're, you're prioritizing costs over safety, okay? And, and, uh, and that's wrong, okay? So, again, walking the talk and talking the talk are two different things, all right? So, uh, cost is a result of doing all the other things right. You cannot cut your way into prosperity. Okay, you can't do that. All right, so do all the other things right, cost will take care of itself. And finally, this is a, a kind of key one. George Sherman came to me one day, our CEO, who I reported to, and George says, Mark, what message do you want me to send? I said, well, look, all I want you to say at our annual conference, um, Palm Springs, 150 of our key leaders, is that DBS is not optional. How do you do DBS? Different, right? Because you have to customize it to your business. We had all kinds of different businesses. We had a plant that made a million sockets for Sears Craftsman hand tools a day. They made a million, I don't know where they went to. Nobody could ever answer that question. A million a day. And we had another company that made two periscopes a year. Okay, so I mean, we had a lot of different businesses, right? And I was, I was not about to uh, legislate from the corporate office, for example, what their visual management system was gonna look like. All I cared about was that the principles were in place of abnormality detection and root cause problem solving. I didn't care if they did it on the back of a napkin. And one of the guys said, well, we have, George Sherman came to me one day and he said, we have to see consistency amongst all our plants. I go, why? Because you go in there once a year? I pushed back on him. I said, we're not doing it for you, George. We're doing it for them. They have to be able to use it, own it, and all that. And that's how you, by, by the way, grow your, your business system because what ends up happening is, they can copy a best practice from another plant, they can come up with their own, they can combine a couple ideas, and that's how the business system grows. Not only does it grow and get better because DBS, TPS, all those things are, quite frankly, subjects for improvement in Kaizen. Why not? You can't say that's static, right? So that's how we grew it and grew new ideas and it's continuing to grow over the years, okay? And uh, the other thing is they had ownership now. It was their idea. I didn't go in from corporate and told them what to do, okay? Big deal, big deal. So uh, we had businesses in the early days that were the most profitable businesses in Danaher, and they were probably the worst lean companies. They were in the right market, with the right price points, all that good stuff, right? And so leadership kind of said, eh, let's give those guys a little break, you know? Not right, okay? And, and so, you know, Let's look at the process that delivers the results. And, uh, uh, but we, we did have, we did have a, a, a non-negotiable, amongst other non-negotiables, and I want to talk a lot about that today, but if you ever want to talk to me about what non-negotiables should look like, I think that's really important to do. Uh, for example, I know Art did this at Wire Mode, we did it too, it said there will be no layoffs because of lean improvement. That's a non-negotiable, okay? I'm not gonna argue about it. Economic declines and stuff like that in the marketplace, different story, but we're not gonna let you go because you kaizen yourself out of a job, okay? That's a non-negotiable, okay? And there's a whole list of those I could talk to you about. So, uh, DBS is not optional, was real key uh, to, uh, to us, and uh, it was the way, we were an operating company, we were in a holding company, so it was the way we were gonna do business. We weren't gonna argue about it, I had one new acquisition. The president said to me, DBS isn't gonna work here. Okay, by the way, it was perfectly set up for you know, flow and sales and all that stuff. Anyway, he said, we're different. And I said, Kevin, yeah, you know what? You are different. Let me tell you how you're different. The average day in her company's operating profit turned in about 17, 18%, you're at three. I said, the average day in her plant is turning 25, 30 times inventory turns, you're at two. Okay, uh, the average day in her plant is shooting at 98, 99% on time delivery to request date, not promise date, request date. And by the way, that's a whole philosophical thing we could talk about too on another day, okay? Uh, I have a real point of view on that. But to request date, 98%, you're at 30%. So Kevin, you're absolutely right, you are different, okay? I said, and, and by the way, Kevin, if you continue to insist on being different, you're gonna need a different job. 
is what I told him. I was very direct with him, okay? And so, um, so that's, that's what you gotta look at. So we basically said DBS is not optional, okay? And uh, by the way, he became one of the biggest proponents of DBS in the company. He really turned around, he really did a great job. So, uh, not because of my talk, I just pissed him off. But, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I wanna point that out to him, that yeah, you are different, okay? And that's why we bought you, because we're gonna change you and, and, and put you into the fold. So it wasn't optional that there are certain things that you can't argue about, chairs in a cell. So how many people here have cells with chairs in it? One, uh, he's, he's the only honest guy here, okay? And uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I see that all the time. And everybody gives you all the reasons in the world why you have to have a chair in a cell. We just said, not optional, we are not having that argument 200 times across the world because you have 200 plants, okay? We're not gonna do that, all right? It's not optional. When you design a cell, there will be no chairs in a cell. And I won't spend the time now to tell you why the reasons are for that, and if you wanna talk to me later, I'd be happy to talk to you about it, but those are the kind of things that we just said not optional, okay? And you gotta do that. You can't argue every single time because you're gonna argue the same points 500 times and you're not gonna win. Okay, so that's what we did uh, uh, with the non-negotiables, okay? So that's, uh, this is the, I think this is gonna be the cover of my book. I don't know, Michael, with Michael Sanaki. I don't know if we're gonna do this or not, but uh, we, we talk about all the things that I've seen over time, right? Over time, as far as, the, it, you know, if I had a guy that works for me, he says, it's the same circus, different clowns. It's the same thing over and over and over again, okay? And we really can change, but we don't do a good job benchmarking and understanding what was successful and what wasn't, you know? And I'm a little bit critical of the focus that Toyota has had, because I think there's been an insistence over the years that everybody becomes like Toyota, okay? I think what you gotta do is you gotta become Toyota-like, and that's different, okay? So, so I just don't think you can copy something like DBS, like wire mold, like TPS. You gotta do your own thing, okay? And uh, guided by principles, which is really key, and, uh, and, that, and that's key. So I talk about what the solutions are in this book about what that's all about, okay? So anyway, I'll stop there before I fall off the stage again and see if there's any uh, questions or comments or whatever. What do you think? What questions do you have? <clears throat> if you're, uh, you're in an HR role, think about the Danaher business system and maybe what, uh, what questions you might have in terms of HR's role at, at Danaher. How do you get, I'm sorry? How do you get buy-in? What is the tool for buy-in? What do you do? Sorry. Oh. Um, first of all, it's education, okay? Uh, you have to educate your leadership team. And Jim alluded to this, okay, because he said it's all about hands-on. You cannot learn how to play golf by watching a bunch of Tiger Woods videos. You have to actually go out and do it. And the learning that happens with hands-on involvement from sales, from HR, from finance, okay, is incredible, okay? I, I had sales guys, for example, on a Smed Kaizen, and the VP of sales came to me and said, I never realized what we put these guys through when we changed orders and didn't have good forecasts, okay? I mean, incredible. But if you don't get them hands-on involved, they're never gonna understand the principles and understand, you could talk to them to your blown in the face, don't shake their head and they'll say, yeah, I understand, okay? Until they get involved, then the light bulbs start coming on, okay? That's to me the key to get that understanding across different disciplines. And you know, most people also think that this is not a business system, this is a production system. It's that, 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 that idea is still out there. If HR does it, it's because it's fashionable. No, we need HR to do it. Okay, HR is an integral part of what we do. And if they don't understand the principles, it's not gonna work, you know? Same with sales, same with finance, and all that, right? So, 
I think the hands-on thing is the real key to that. that. That's my experience anyway. So, okay. Anybody else? Yeah. We have a couple mics here, so. Okay, Jim's coming. Great presentation, Mark. Um, when you first started and uh, transitioned over the years with the, the DBS system, um, what was the balance between promoting from within for the lean office of credible people and bringing outside people in? We, well, we were a grown company. We had to bring outside people in. We had to, you know. And uh, uh, the danger today, though, so, so we got a lot of people that came in that were kind of like virgin lean guys and mm -hmm. ladies, right? And, uh, but now today, the marketplace is totally different and there's a lot of flavors of lean that are out there today. So the people that you end up bringing in today are gonna have their perspective on what, the, and, and by the way, I would say probably 90% of them that are out there today are doing fake lean and don't understand the core principles that Jim talked about and all that. So you really gotta be careful as to who you bring in, okay? And today, it's a different game than it was when Ori and I did this, okay? Because we were able to take somebody and train them. We didn't have a lot of confusion in the market, but you look at, go on LinkedIn today, you look at all the stuff that's out there. There's d d uh, demand flow, TOC, Kata, Harada. Uh, I mean, it goes down, the, there's an alphabet soup of stuff. And if I was starting today and I wanted to find out where to start, I'm sorry, okay? We didn't have that confusion, we had an advantage. I mean, a disadvantage was that we didn't know about the benchmark except for Toyota, okay? The advantage was we didn't have any, somebody else to benchmark. <laughs> because You see what I'm saying? And so uh, it was e I think it was actually easier for us then than it is today. But you gotta be careful who you bring in. I do think if you're a growing company, you're gonna need to bring outside people in over the course of time. And by the way, infuse new thinking into the, into the fold too, okay? I had a battle with bringing in GE people who wanted to change DBS to Six Sigma. I fought, I spent so much non-value at a time fighting this thing. I mean, they were creating Six Sigma clicks and Six Sigma councils and wanted to replace DBS with, and, I, and the way I looked at Six Sigma, and I'm certified in Six Sigma, right? Great tool. I put the Six Sigma concepts and tools on the same level as 5S, as standard work, as Kanban, as all those tools that we talk about, SMED, TPM, and it sat evenly, equally on the toolbox as opposed to elevating a tool to become the center of your business system. And that's the mistake that Motorola made, and that's the mistake that GE made, okay? And you do not build a business system around a tool, okay? And so what's gonna happen, I'm going back to your question, the people you do bring in are gonna come in with baggage. And you gotta be real careful about making sure that you can mold them back to the fundamentals and the basics that Jim talked about, as opposed to just letting things happen haphazardly, okay? So it's, it's a tough thing today, tougher today, I think, than it was when we did it. So it's my, my take, so. Yes. Sorry. Uh, as you went through implementing DBS through the organization, what were some of the pitfalls that leaders fell into? Uh, and what were some of your, what, were some, what are some of your tips to learn from that? Well, one of, the, one of the pitfalls that we had was quite frankly how we compensated people. Because what it did was it, it, uh, it promoted short-term thinking, okay? Let me give you a specific example. Jake Break where I came from, where Lean started basically in the United States, so the spark was lit. I happened to be there at the same time, okay? Now at the time, I was cost systems manager. I became CFO, then I went into operations, general management, and all that, then I, then I was asked by George Sherman to, he, he basically said, I love what you guys did at Jake Brake, I want you to do for Dan or her what you did for Jake Brake. That's all, that was my direction, okay? And that gave birth to the Dan Her business system, okay? Anyway. Once Jake break really kicked butt, we quadrupled the volumes, 30, 35% operating profit. We took productivity, and I could show you some slides there if you want me to send them to you. Uh, you know, three break kits for 100 man hours to 45 break kits. Four times the revenue with the same headcount, the same floor space, 
I mean, all that stuff, right? Lead time, the whole thing, right? Delivery. So what they used Jakebreak for was to groom future presidents, okay? So this one guy went in there, and, and uh, I won't mention who he is. You probably know him. And uh, he, uh, he went in there, and Sherman said to me, hey, go in and kind of look at their strategy deployment, or Dan Urkel, we call it the policy deployment, but go, in, go and look at their policy deployment. So I went in there, and I said, Bill, I said, why is productivity on here? I mean, I'm not saying it can't be improved, but that's not strategic for this company anymore, okay? We can continue to improve it, right? Why is delivery on here? We've been, we've been delivering 99.8% of the customer request date since customer was a private. Why is that on your policy deployment? That should be relegated to daily management, okay? What really needed to be on his policy deployment was the fact that the Jake break, if you know what that is, was being engineered into the engine and the, the bolt-on Jake break, as you know it today, was gonna go away. That was the strategic thrust of that company, what they should have been focused on. However, he was only there for a year, and he knew it, to prove that he could be a president. So what did he do? He focused on short-term things that didn't really matter for the strategy of the business. And I actually said to him, I said, you know, Bill, I said, I said uh, it's, it's time for you to stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about the 500 people that are gonna lose their jobs, okay? So what I'm trying to, I'm giving you that as a story that basically says a lot of times our short-term incentives got in the way of real sustainable long-term results. And so you gotta be really careful of that. You see what I'm saying? Does that, does that make sense? Makes sense? I mean, that's, that's just one of many examples I could give you, okay? So. so I'm sorry, we have a couple of microphones out here, but we are out of time. So please help me thank Mark. Thank you.